Okay. I'm planning to put my lecture notes online at a certain point when I organize them. The thing that prevents me is that I have a deadline. So I don't have much time at the moment, but it will be over this week. Now, share screen. Uh, yeah. Share. Okay, good. Can you see my screen? Can you see yes. My screen? So where were we? We are talking about uh, decays and scatterings. Which are amongst the fundamental phenomena that is being uh, studied in particle physics. Let me just move that a little bit so I clear myself slightly more space around here. Okay. Uh, we spoke about lifetime of a decaying particle, right? We said that tau is one over gamma, where n is n zero e minus gamma t. We spoke about the uncertainty in the mass of a decaying particle. Right. We said that uh, the wave function is described by the bright Wigner function. This is something which is internal to the particle, right? It's not something because of the measure. Psi of m squared is one over m minus m zero squared plus gamma over two squared. This is the Lorentzian or bright Wigner. Um, we spoke about, we started to speak a little bit about scattering. Right, I introduced the concept of, uh, well, we discussed a little bit about the, uh, you know, the classical Rutherford uh, uh, scattering experiment. Right, Rutherford. And we introduced, um, we introduced the concept of a cross section, which is a measurable quantity and has dimensions of area. And of course, most importantly, we can calculate it theoretically. So this is a way of um, connecting the theory and the experiments. Um, right. Um, then we discussed a few experimental issues such as a thin target versus thick target. And we define the beam flux. Phi as the number of particles sent to the target per unit time, per unit area. Number per unit time, per unit area. And the luminosity, which is the flux multiplied by the number of target particles. My number of target particles. L is phi times n target. And then the rate of scattering events that we have, dn scattering over dt is just the cross section times L. 
And then I gave you one classical example, right? That of a point like light particles, which are in a beam that hit a target uh, particles that are heavy and spherical with radius R. So example one, we had those light particles that go and hit a target of some radius R, right? Which is spherical. And uh, the uh, scattering is defined if the particle actually hits the target, you know, the, the billiard ball hit. In which case, then intuitively we get that the cross section is sigma is just pi r squared. Another classical example is, um, you know, the measurement of scattering into a solid angle. So example two, I'll just give it to sort of complete the recap. All right, so I have two particles, right? So one is moving right in the beam and it's being scattered into some solid angle, right? So you said that the solid angle here, right? Um, this is theta and this is of course, d omega. All right, so uh, if this is theta, well, this is d theta. No, oh, where did I? Where did you erase it? All right, this is d theta. All right, we have d omega. It's just sine theta, d theta, d phi. All right, so we need to do like a Here we have sort of, a, again, a beam. So we do uh, something like that. Of course, this is the impact parameter. This is a different color. This is the impact parameter B, and that would be DB, right? And that area would be uh, D phi. Right, in that cross sectional area, this is D sigma. So, you know, classically, right, the, the scattering angle is fully determined by the impact parameter. Uh, we can carry the calculation according to Newtonian laws. Right? Uh, now, the cross section is the size of the aerial element. Uh, which the particle must collide in order to be scattered at angle theta to theta plus theta. So this is theta and this would be you know, theta plus d theta. So it's at the classically, right, um, the cross section um, is the size of the area um, or area element um, in which the particle must collide um, in order to scatter at angle theta to theta plus d theta, right? So from here, from the cartoon, right, the sigma scattering is just b, which can be a function of theta times db times d phi. Right. This is the sigma. But this is the this is the area, the sigma. Now, since the omega is sine theta d theta d phi, right? I can basically divide them and write down the sigma d omega. I'm not really dividing; it's just the quickest way of showing it. Although it's a bit rough. 
it's b of theta over sine theta and then um, db over the theta. Still your feeling. Right, so we just need to use some classical physics to find out what is what is b of theta, right? So once b of theta is known, we can put it into the equation and find out the sigma d omega, uh, which is of course called the differential cross section. Right. There's no real differential here when you think of it. It's just uh, this being the, the angular dependence of the cross section in uh, um, the scattering, which plotted here is elastic scattering, just the angular. Dependence of the cross section. in an elastic scattering. Now, the, the really important thing to remember is that, um, you know, classically at least, everything is determined once we know the impact parameter B, but practically we, we, can, we don't really have a way of measuring the impact parameter. What we can measure is this, um, is the cross section. But of course, uh, at least classically, they are uh, they are dependent. Right? Once you know the cross section, what is the impact parameter and vice versa. So you know this is this is not just for elastic scattering, of course, right? We can ask various questions, right? So, uh, for example, if we have an inelastic scattering, uh, it is limited limited to elastic scattering. Of course, right? I mean, for example, if we if we look at the creation of a Z boson. Uh, via inelastic scattering, you know, uh, for example, proton proton collide and produce a Z plus something else, right? Proton plus proton produce a Z plus whatever, X, right? We can ask what is the total cross section or what is the total or what is the cross section as a function of the momentum of Z? Ask, right, EG. Right, uh, what is the um, sigma over dpz, right? The cross section as a function of momentum, et cetera, right? Or, you know, if we have UV photons that, that heat us, uh, heat the skin, right? We can ask, what is the cross section for some dangerous mutation to happen? Right. If we if we know the answer to that, then we know what is the flux of photons that arrive to our skin from the sun, then we can calculate what's the probability of getting cancer or something bad of that thing per year, of course. All right, this was a quick recap uh, with things that I needed to complete from last time. Um, any questions? No, okay, it's quite easy. So it's not very technical, so I don't expect many questions, but just to make sure that you're all with me. Okay, so what I wanna do today, I wanna do the quantum mechanical treatment and that goes to Fermi's golden rule. I think I told you I had a little bit of um, thought with myself whether I should uh, fully derive from a golden rule because it's normally being derived in quantum mechanics course. I just speak about it, which is what typically being done in this course. Um, so 
So right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak about it. And if we have time, I'll put a tutorial or an appendix or sometime when I when I derive it. But that depending on how much time we have. The reason why I'm deriving straight away is because it's something which, as I mentioned, is derived in standard quantum mechanics course. So you're supposed to learn it or will learn it uh, in the second semester, uh, if not now. Uh, and because I want to focus really on the things of interest to us. So I'll actually explain it to you more than derive it right now, but if I have time, I'll derive it um, later on. Um, so, you know, we know that particles are quantum, quantum uh, objects, right? And we want to know what's the probability for a quantum process to happen, right? So, you know, something like a radioactive decay or scattering of two elementary particles. Um, so the calculation as stated is called the Fermi's golden rule. And it really depends on two ingredients. So um, let me write it down. The probability of a radioactive decay or scattering event is called this first was first derived by Fermi was first derived. of course it's Enrico Fermi right Fermi and he is called Fermi is golden I know what is the other reason why I'm not going to derive it right now, because in many, you can derive it in the framework of classical quantum mechanics and in the framework of quantum field theory, and it's a bit different. So normally what you learn is to derive it in the framework of classical, classical quantum mechanics. Uh, I will actually give you all the rules how to derive it in, uh, in quantum field theory, but this I definitely would not be able to discussed in this course because that requires some deeper knowledge of quantum field theory. So it's one of those cases where I give you the outcome. So you know how to do it, but in order to get the full um, derivation of it, you have to learn quantum field theory first. So uh, the Fermi's golden rule depends on two ingredients, right? Um, it depends on two ingredients, right? So the first is the amplitude. One is the amplitude, which is denoted by M. It's also called the invariant amplitude or the matrix element. matrix element that also you see that in textbooks a lot. TFI, so it's transition matrix element. Um, by the way, how many of you have studied Fermi's golden rule? I think I asked you, but I don't remember the answer. Uh, who studied it? Raise your hands. One, two, one, two, that's all. So nobody, there is one with no, with no camera. So I don't know if, if you raise your hand or not. Uh, two studied and the rest did not study. Okay, is there any question? You see the one is still raising your hand. No? Okay. So I may put it in, the, in one of the tutorials that I'll have to see. So the amplitude M, uh, the amplitude contains all the dynamical information. Right, it contains all the dynamical information. Right, we will. I'll show you how to calculate it using the relevant Feynman rules, which are derived from the relevant Feynman diagrams. Right, it's calculating calculated 
using Feynman rules. are derived from the appropriate Feynman diagrams. The second part is the available phase space for the process. Uh, that's also known as the density of states. Basically, it tells you uh, all the kinematics information. You know, if a particle decays, then to what particles it can decay. Essentially, it uh, tells you the, the probability of decaying into each of the possible final decay, the final um, uh, outcome is identical. So that's why the same is called the available phase space. Available phase space, right? This is known as the density of final states. Right? That contains all the kinematics. Um, you know, the mass, energy, momenta, masses, energies, momenta, um, uh, of the particles, of the out, outgoing particles. Well, all, of all the particles incoming as well. Um, it reflects the fact that a given process is more likely to occur if there are more available options, basically, for the particles, the final state. So, uh, uh, the given process is more likely to occur Uh, if there are more available options, or available channels, really, I should say. Uh, so, you know, for example, if we're talking about the decay of a heavy particle into lighter ones, there is a large phase space, basically. But if we speak about the decay of the neutron, right? The neutron decays into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino. Um, there is no extra mass to spare in some basic sense, right? So the available phase space is actually very small. Um, so in essence, um, right, the Fermi's golden rule really states that the transition rate from the initial to the final states is, is given by the product of the phase space and the absolute square of the amplitude. Um, so let's use it and then I'll introduce it and, and show you how to use it. And uh, as I told you, if we have some time, I'll, I'll actually do the derivation, this from the quantum mechanical derivation. Questions? No? Okay. So let's write down the golden rule for decays. So we have a particle. We can assume it's at rest, it's just a choice of um, reference frame, right? Which decays into several other particles, right? So we have particle one that decays into two, three, four, and right, so decays into n minus one particles. Then the decay rate mm -hmm. 
again, it's measured in the particles rest frame, is given by gamma is capital S over two M1. And then we have integral over M squared and then two pi to the four delta four P1 minus P2 minus minus Pn times multiplication, so pi from j equal to two to n of two pi times delta pj squared minus mj squared times theta of ej times d four pj divided by two pi to the four. That is the golden rule. Now, let's go one, one term by one term and see what it means. Let's put it in the gold or oh, yellow. Okay, so MJ, that's obvious. That's the mass of the J particle. Pj, of course, is the four momentum of the J particle. And of course, Ej is just Pj with zero component. Is the energy. Right now, uh, uh, S, the capital S, S is a statistical factor that corrects for double counting. Uh, so when we have identical particles in the final states, right? So S, this is a statistical factor, factor that corrects or double counting. When there are identical particles. In the final state. Um, so if we have S, small s identical particle, or small s identical particles, identical particles. S is one over S factorial. But if we don't have any identical particles, then what would be capital S? One. No identical particles, no identical particles means that S equal to one. M is the amplitude, is amplitude, which is really a function of uh, the various momenta. Right. As we said, this contains all the information about the dynamics. Uh, okay. Now, everything else I believe that you know here, right? The delta function is a delta function. A theta function gives you zero and one, right? So theta, theta of ej, right, is one if ej is greater than zero and zero if ej is smaller or equal to zero. And the delta functions uh, is just delta function. Um, uh, okay, and the choice of course is the rest frame, which is the natural choice when we speak of a particle that decays. 
because it doesn't have any interaction with anything else. It just decides to decay. Um, now, except for this um, M for the amplitude, right? Uh, everything else really is a phase space. If you look uh, for a moment at what we have here, uh, it's just a phase space, right? It just tells us that we have to integrate over for all four momenta, right? This is the phi, right? We are multiplying uh, over all, so we have integration, continuous integration over all four momenta. So there are many integrals here, really. But these are subject uh, to three kinematic constraints. So really, the golden rule is about um, phase space, um, right? So except from M, right? Uh, everything else else is else. is a phase space. Right. You basically integrate over um, uh, all outgoing for momenta. Uh, subject to three kinematic constraints. Right. So the first constraint, you can see it from here. Let me write it down. This is the first constraint. And this is the second constraint, and this is the third constraint. So what do these constraints physically mean? Let's see. So constraint number one, right? Here, right? This just states that each outgoing particle, right? I'm multiplying over all the outgoing particles. These are real particles. These are not virtual particles, right? So it must lie on the mass shell. So pj squared, which is e squared minus pj vector squared, right? Is, is just the mass squared, right? So one is that uh, each outgoing particle is real, uh, so pj squared just pj squared minus pj squared is just mj squared. So this is the meaning of this delta function, right? So delta pj squared minus mj squared is just delta of e j squared minus p j vector squared minus m j squared. The second constraint here, what does it physically mean? What is the physical meaning of this constraint? Any idea? Well, it certainly means something. That particles have energy, positive energy? Exactly. That uh, each of the outgoing particles, energy is positive. Very good. 
each of the outgoing particles. Energy is positive. Right? Pj zero, why right, is Vj must be greater than zero. Right? Remember that the theta function of Ej will give us one if Ej is greater than zero and zero if Ej is not. Okay? We cannot have particles with negative energies in the decay process. And the third constraint, reminding you, that's a simple constraint. Momentum conservation. Exactly. This is, well, it's a four momentum, so it's really energy and momentum conservation. So the third constraint, right, this is energy and momentum. conservation, right? So the delta, right? delta four P1 minus P2 minus minus Pn, right? And just um, find mu from zero to three, delta function of P1 mu minus P2 mu minus, minus Pn mu, right? Which is just delta E1 is equal to minus E2 minus minus Vn times by i from 1 to 3 delta of P1i minus P2i minus minus Vni. Right, so this simply states that the energy of the outgoing particle is equal to the energy of the incoming particle and the momentum, the sum of momentum of the outgoing particle is equal to the momentum of the initial particle, right? So really when you think of it in, the, in these terms, I think it makes much more sense now that you look at the golden rule, right? It just says that um, all the outcomes that are consistent with these three constraints are essentially equally likely to occur. That's that's what the golden rule states. So it's kind of very cool. Yeah. So uh, the golden rule rule states that all outcomes. Consistence uh, with these three kinematic constraints um, are equally likely. It's that simple. Uh, ah, just one more comment, I see, for the two pies. So again, you learn that this is a really a convention. Uh, so I'm using, again, a standard convention in textbooks. There are other conventions, actually, so it depends which textbook you're looking at. Uh, so for the two pi rules, so every delta function gets a two pi, and every integration, D, gets a one over two pi. As you're going to see, these are actually going to cancel each other. So these are the convention that we're using. Convention. You want the two pi convention. Right, every delta function gets a two pi factor and every um, integration, integration gets uh, so integration that means d, right? D something gets um, one over two pi. 
So this is, this is the convention that they will cancel each other. Now we can take the golden rule and slightly simplify it. Okay, so this is this is just the convention that we have. So let's take the golden rule. So is the convention for one dimensional or for four dimensional delta no, it's integrals? Delta is four dimensional. We have two pi to the four because delta is uh, four uh, delta to the four. Okay. Each dimension gets a two pi. Uh, okay. Now, uh, okay. Now let's take that and simplify that a little bit. So the way to simplify, let's see, I have a way. No, there was a way here, which I can do that. What happens? Much if I do that, what happens? Oh, great. I can do a copy. Now I can take it and paste it. Woohoo! It's a great technology. Okay, so now let's make some simplification. So simplification. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, one question. Yeah. You said that the, all the decays are equally likely, but in the PDG that you gave us a look at in the homework, it, it talks about decays that are very common and some that are almost non-existent. So how does that work? I know what I mean is that all decay channels are equally likely. Now you have particles that, you know, we discussed that in the last time, or one before last time and in the tutorial. Of course, in order for it to exist, right, uh, you have to obey all the rules, all the conservation rules that we discussed, right? If, uh, if you have a particle that, you know, that does not obey the conservation rules, right, the lepton number, lepton uh, family number, etc., cetera, then obviously this is not gonna happen. Uh, only, only the rules that, the, the only the decay, the decay channel that can occur are only those that obey all these conservation rules that we have. But if you have multiple, if, if a particle can decay via several channels, for example, the tau um, particle can decay into a muon or into an electron, right? Plus uh, the, the corresponding neutrinos, right? Now, um, uh, you have a much larger phase space. What the Fermi tells you basically is that you have to look at the entire phase space, right? And, uh, and uh, each of the possibilities that appear in the phase space is equally likely, right? So since uh, the electron is lighter, then you have more phase space options, right? To split the, the energy uh, between the tau and the neutrinos. That between the electron and the neutrinos, then you have between the muon and the neutrinos, right? So this is what the Fermi Golden Rule tells us, basically, that when we look at all these decays that are legal, so they are not violating any of the conservation laws, then you look at all the possible channels; they are equally likely. And when I say channels, I mean you know how the momentum is split among the decay products. Okay, so think of it, um, maybe I, I simply have to derive the Fermi golden rule or you have to simply read about it. it just look at, it's just a phase space. You know, if you have a possibility of decaying in, into, um, I gave you the example of the neutron decay as an example of a decay that doesn't have many channels because the proton mass is very similar to the neutron mass. Right, so you cannot um, you cannot have a situation where you, the proton has a little energy and the electron has a lot of energy, right? But if uh, let's say the proton was much lighter, then you could divide the energy in different ways among the proton and the electron and the neutrino, so you have more options to split it, and then it will be more likely. That's what it means. 
So if I understand, you have, let's say you have a hundred different channels and you could have that 70 go to give you one specific product and 30 give you another, but each single phase is equal in likeliness. Correct. Yes, you understand it properly. Thank you. What about the matrix element? Well, okay, that depends on the matrix element. Well, the matrix element, we said that that will take care of all the dynamical, uh, right? Um, this will eventually tell you if you can or cannot do that, right? That if, have, uh, if you're violating anything, it will be zero. If you're not violating, then, then it will not be zero. That's exactly, that. I'm gonna calculate that. I don't know if today or, or the next lecture. Uh, well, not I'm going to show you how to calculate the matrix element from the Feynman diagram. That's where the coupling constant enters that, that we have in each uh, in each vertex. I think this is the scribe of the alphas. You are going to get into the calculation of M. All right. So let's do more questions. Oh, okay, so let's do a little bit of a simplification, slight simplification of this uh, of this uh, formula. So uh, we have um, integral over d four p. So um, d four p. I can write this d p zero d cube p vector, which is just d e d cube p or d p vector. Now, since we write explicitly DE, DE is DP0, and I can, we can carry explicitly the integral over DE. We can carry explicitly the integration over DE. And we do that using the delta function. So when we have a delta of p squared minus m squared, right? This is just a delta of p zero squared minus p vector squared minus m squared. So we can use the delta uh, function. But we have to be a little bit careful because we have the integral over dp zero and the delta is over P zero squared. So we use the identity which you can find in any mathematical textbook. The delta of X squared minus A squared is equal to one over two A times delta of X minus A plus delta of X plus A provided that A is greater than zero. So again, this is a mathematical identity of the delta function. Open your favorite mathematical uh, handbook text and you'll find it there. Uh, and then we have this multiplication of delta times theta. So we have theta of ej. So ej is just p0. I'm omitting for the calculation the, the j uh, index, right? Times delta of p0 squared minus p vector squared minus m squared. This is equal to one over two square root of p vector squared plus m squared. Right, that's the one over two a times delta of p0 minus square root of p vector squared minus plus m squared. Now, what happens to the second term in the delta? The theta takes care of it. The theta killed it, right? Because it was it has a negative energy, right? Here, p zero is equal to p squared plus m squared, and the other one, the other term is p zero equal minus p squared plus m squared. So this is negative. So the, the theta function killed it. Okay. Um, so this delta function, now we can cancel with the integral over dp0. Right, so we have now a delta function of p0 and we cancel with the integral of dp0. And we end up 
what it's writing that gamma, right, is S over two M one integral M squared times two pi to the four times delta to the four um, P one minus P two minus minus P N. We haven't touched that times pi j from two to n of one over two times square root of p e squared plus m squared. And well, now I have to keep back in j, right? So pj squared plus m squared j. And then we have just in three integral, b cube pj over two pi cube, right? One of the two pi was canceled. Uh, now we still have one delta function, right? Which we can use every time we're seeing um, you know, pj zero or ej. Now we don't see pj zero here, but you can have a pj zero inside m, right? So every time um, uh, pj zero ej appears inside M, where you can use we use the remaining delta function. And to write up right PJ zero PJ squared plus mj squared. Now, in fact, this equation here is, is more useful than the original golden rule for practical purposes, but uh, I did not derive, I did not state it, you know, I just stated the golden rule because the golden rule makes um, the physical uh, intuition of what's happening there is much much easier pronounced than if I write down this equation. All right, questions? Okay, let's do an example. It makes things easy to understand. So example, so two particle decay. What it really means is there is a single particle that decays into two particles, right? That simply means that n is equal to three, right? So particle one decays into particles two plus particle three, which is the simplest that we can think of. So let's put this in equation 18, in the equation here. Let's call it star, use star. So gamma is S. Now the factors of two. So J is equal to from two to three. So we have it twice. So we have here another four, we have two three and said with two to the power six, but here we have two to the power four. So they cancel out. So we have another four, another four that's 16, two is 32. So I have 32 um, um, and then pi's, right? So pi to the four and here we have pi to the six. So we end up with pi, pi squared m one. And then we have integral of m squared delta four of P1 minus P2 minus P3 divided by, well, it's a multiplication. So it's square root of P2 squared plus M2 squared times square root of P3 squared plus M3 squared 
d cube p2 d cube p3. Okay. You all with me? That's the integral that we need to solve. Uh, like we have a four dimensional delta function, but here we only have an integration over um, uh, um, three dimensional real space, right? Through real momentum. So, what we do is we simply write down delta four of P1 minus P2 minus P3 is just delta P10 minus P20 minus P30 times delta cube P1 minus P2 minus P3, right? Now, we argue that we work in the rest frame of particle one, which of course considerably simplify things in the rest frame of particle one. Then, of course, we have what is a P1 vector? Zero. Of course, right? P1 vector is equal to zero, right? And P1, the zeroth component, what is it? Mass. Right. It's just E1, which is just the mass of particle one. So automatically, uh, at least from the last delta function, then we have delta Q of P1 minus P2 minus P3 is just delta Q of um, P2 and plus P3, right? Which obviously states immediately that P2 or P3 is equal to minus P2. Right. And so we can automatically cancel the integrate, use the delta function to cancel the integration over dp, dp3. So cancel the integration over dp3. Right. Now, since we have e1 is equal to m1, so one and two. So one, we have that. Two, we have uh, E1 is equal to M1. Then we end up the delta of P1, zero minus P2, zero minus P3, zero, right? Is just equal to delta of M1 minus, well, P2, zero is just P2 vector squared plus M2 squared minus square root of P3 vector squared minus uh, plus M3 squared. Why right, did that appear to everybody? What I'm doing here? So we plug that back um, uh, in the calculation of the, of the decay rate and we end up with a gamma, we had S so gamma is S over 32 pi squared M1. And then integral M squared. And then we have this delta M1 minus square root of P2 squared plus M2 squared. And minus square root of P3 squared plus M3 squared, right? Divided by square root of P2 squared plus M2 squared times square root of P3 
squared plus m3 squared. All right, we have, we have it from here. And then we still have the remaining delta cube of P2 plus P3 times D cube P2, D cube P3. So we use the, now the delta function to integrate over DP, DP3, right? Use the delta function to integrate over dp3. Well, uh, the qp3, of course. Then we end up with uh, gamma, which is s over 32 pi squared m1. Uh, integral of m squared delta m1 minus square root of p2 uh, squared plus m2 squared minus square root of p2 squared plus m3 squared, right? Because of the delta function, I could replace P2 and P3, it's a squared, so it doesn't matter, right? And the same in the denominator. Square root of P2 squared plus M2 squared times square root of P2 squared plus M3 squared. And now we're simply left with integration over D cube P2. That's the nice thing about these things. You end up, you start with the very nasty integrals, but then you have made plenty of delta functions and uh, you end up uh, not having to do, well, as you're gonna see, we're not gonna make any integration at all. So we still have to do the integration over dqp2. So in order to proceed, again, um, it's best to work in spherical coordinates, but it's really spherical coordinates in phase space, right? Because it's P is the momentum. So to proceed, uh, we use spherical coordinates. Well, it's, remember, it's a phase space ring. So P2 vector, well, we'll write it using P, theta, and phi. Um, and that is, that is allowed, and you know it's always allowed, of course, it's it's um, it's useful because everything we have here depends on p two vector squared, right? On the on the magnitude of the vector. So you know everything uh, makes sense. Yes, makes sense since uh, all terms depend on P2 square, which is just P square, right? Uh, specifically, this is true because the matrix element M is a scalar. And uh, the only scalar you can make from a vector is the dot product of the vector with itself, right? So M, since M is a scalar, then M is M of P2 dot P2, uh, which is just P squared. So we can do that. So M is M of P. So if we do that, then integral or, no. uh, yeah d cube p2, right, it's integral p squared dp and times integral sine theta d theta d phi. Right? You should really write p theta and p phi, but hopefully you understand what I'm doing. Uh, now the angular integrals are pretty straightforward, right? So an integral from zero to pi 
of sine theta d theta. How much is that? Two. Two, thank you. Integral from zero to two pi of d phi is just two pi. So surprise, surprise, we end up with the four pi term, which cancels with the 32 pi squared. So we have gamma just s over eight pi m one integral of m of p squared, and then the delta right m one minus square root p squared plus m two squared minus square root p squared minus m three squared. divided by square root of p squared plus m2 squared times square root p squared plus m3 squared squared and then times p squared dp okay we're nearly there we still have one delta function which we did not use which is great because we're going to use it to cancel the last integral but in order to do it properly, we use a trick. So we use a trick. So we write down, we make a change of variable essentially. So we change variable to u, which is defined as p squared plus m2 squared plus p squared plus m3 squared. And then du, right, is just u times p divided by square root of p squared plus m2 squared times square root of p squared plus m3 squared times p. Which you can check by immediate substitution. And again, using these results in gamma, then we end up with gamma is s over eight pi m one times integral. And okay, I need to set the bound boundary of integration. So p is equal to zero. That means that u is equal to m one plus m two. So it's m sorry m two plus m three m two plus m three to infinity. And that is because p equal to zero, that is u is equal to m2 plus m3. So these are the boundaries, right? So we have m of p squared, we haven't touched that. And then we have delta of m1 minus u times p over u du. which looks much nicer than previously. Right? Uh, of course, the delta function now simply gives u is equal to m1. Um, uh, so, delta function implies that u is equal to m1 and we can use that back in the definition of u here and if we do that then we find out that p which we write as p0 just 1 over 2m1 square root of m1 to the four plus m2 to the four plus m3 to the four minus two m1 squared m2 squared minus two minus two m1 squared m3 squared minus two m2 squared m3 squared. Right. This is simply plugging that in the, in the equation here for you. 
So this is, uh, again, small homework for you to check it out. I checked it out, uh, but don't, don't believe me. Just plug it in and see that that's what you get. Uh, so, you know, P here, right? Remember, P here is a particular value of P2, right? Which is consistent with the conservation of energy. Right? P, right? So P0 is a particular value of the magnitude of P2, which is consistent with conservation of energy. Yeah. So we can simply plug it into the delta function, right? And the delta function really kills the integration over, um, over u, right? We have only one u in the denominator, which is now turned into an m1. So finally, right, we get that gamma is s over eight pi m1 squared. Right now we have the magnitude of p times the matrix element squared. That's it. Well, I think this is beautiful uh, because I ended up not doing any integral when you think of it, except from the angular integration where it's defined and the theta, right? But we didn't have to carry any integral. I mean, it looks quite annoying. Think how many integrals we had at the beginning but, um, you know, uh, we had enough delta functions, which essentially cancel out everything. So we didn't have to integrate at all. Again, kind of makes sense because in this case, what do we have? We have a single particle, which we're looking at the restraint. So it's just sitting there and then it decays. So it decays into two particles and they have to have the same magnitude of momenta and, and the opposite direction. And of course, the energy needs to be conserved. So we have enough conservation here that tells us everything, right? Again, the dynamics is in the matrix element. This will tell us the probability of the decay itself. But that, that we're going to calculate from the Feynman diagram. Not sure if we'll have time today. If not today, we'll, have, we'll, we'll, we'll do it on Thursday. Uh, okay, just a few more comments. Um, so comments, just uh, final remarks on that comment. Uh, so I said that M depends only on the magnitude of the vector P2. Uh, that is not exactly accurate because it may depend also on another vector, which is the uh, angular momentum of the decaying particles, right? So M may depend not only on P, but also on J, right, the angular momentum. Of the decaying particle. which I happily ignored in this calculation. Uh, so we may construct another scalar, which is P dot J, right? So we don't, we're not only obliged to, to just one scalar. Um, now this, of course, the set a direction, right? Because we can say that P dot J is, is, um, has a preferred direction, which is, um, um, you know, call it the Z direction. Uh, of course, if the case, then I can no longer use the, the you know, carry happily the integration over the theta because now it's uh, not a spherical symmetry. Uh, so it just complicates my life. 
everybody's life. Uh, I said we did not solve really any integral. This is one, two, we did, we ended up not the integral. Uh, again, uh, we had the opposite moment of the outgoing particles, we had conservation of energy, and um, you know, as long as the, the, the decaying particle is a scalar particle, right, doesn't have, it's not a vectorial particle, doesn't carry any angular momentum, then um, we don't have any dependence on their orientation. So it was easy. Uh, of course, if we if a particle decays into more than two particles, then we do have to carry full integration. We, we will not have will not be able to escape it. Um, questions about that? Any questions? I mean, you know, last last uh, lecture was more like a storytelling, so I didn't expect that you have many questions. But this now we're getting somewhat um, into more technicalities. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Yeah, please. The uh, the final result of the decay rate um, it depends on on the momentum. And this, if I understand correctly, is the momentum of the decay product. So it has no index, but you called that the original P two, right? Yes, yes, it's a, yeah. But if I understand correctly, if a decay, we're working in the center of mass frame, so there's no. a particle at rest and then two fly apart, but they could no, have pretty much any momentum as long as momentum, con as long as energy no. is concerned, right? Oh, no, 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 you have this equation. Right? This is one, this is really, you can think of it as this being dependent, you know, this is, a value of the momentum, which depends on the masses of the particles, right? And this so is the only momentum that you can get from this decay? Uh, yes, this is the only one that is consistent with the... With the, with the conserving con both energy and momentum. Yes. This, this uh, magnitude here enters the decay rate. So if you're if a particle decays into know that this depends on the masses of the particle. So you have m1 okay. is the so it's, so it's a parameter of the of the problem. It's not, yes. it's not something you can tune. Exactly. So you know if, if a particle decays into other particles, you know if you have several options to decay, right? Then this will get a different value. Oh, I see. But given that mass m1 decays into masses m2 and plus m3, the the final momenta not just the relative momentum, but the actual momentum of both particles is fixed. Yes, this is fixed. This okay. is fixed by the kinematics. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. More? Okay, then we have enough time to go over the golden wolf for scattering. As you see, I'm again. I'm going. I'm not going to derive it. I'm going to state it, and then we're going to manipulate it a little bit, like we did with the with the uh, golden rule for um, for the decay. And fortunately, it's going to be very similar. This is not really surprising to anybody. Uh, there's a slight difference. So let's speak about again golden rule for scattering. Right, so again, suppose now we have two particles that collide. So particles one plus two, they collide and produce set of particles three plus four plus plus n, right? Of course, what we care about, what we're interested in is to calculate the scattering cross section. And that is calculated in a very similar way to the golden rule for the decay. Um, again, the, the, the calculation in fact, from a quantum field theory point of view is exactly the same. Um, there are a few factors which, again, I, we didn't derive them, but uh, you have, we have to go through the entire quantum field theory to see exactly where it comes from. So I'm just avoiding that. 
So the cross section um, for the process is given by sigma, it's just S, it's the same as we had previously, divided by four. Now we have square root of P1 dot P2 squared minus M1, M2 squared times integral of m squared and then again we have times 2 pi to the 4 delta to the 4 p1 plus p2 minus p3 minus p4 minus minus pn multiplies by integrals multiplying all the, uh, over all the outgoing particles, j from three to n of two pi delta pj squared minus mj squared theta pj zero, and then d four pj divided by two pi to the four. So again, pi is the four momentum of particle i, uh, having mass mi, statistical factor s is the same statistical factor that we had previously. Uh, phase space is the same. So again, we can perform all the pj0 integrals. So let's just, let's first say, this is the golden rule. Right. Now we can perform uh, uh, all the pj0 integrals that, again, the same way as we, the same method as we did previously. So performing all the pj0 integrals. There's no need for me to repeat those again. You can simply go over the calculation at home or read it in a textbook if you like. Then you end up that sigma is s over four, again, square root of p1 dot p2 squared minus m1 m2 squared integral m squared times 2 pi to the 4 delta 4 p1 plus p2 minus p3 minus minus pn multiply by pi J from three to whether you're familiar with this pi thing, right? Multiplication of. Yeah, right. Is there anybody who is not familiar with that symbol? Like a sum, but multiplying, right? J uh, uh, J from three to n of one over square root of p j squared plus m j squared d cube pj over two pi cube. And again, uh, pj zero is just square root of pj vector squared plus m squared, mj squared. Right? Every time we see it, whether it's in the, inside the delta function or inside the m. Okay, so again, we can take the example and the simple example is a uh, two body scattering in the center of mass frame. Right. Right. So if we think of the scattering process, one plus two goes to three plus four, right? So in the center of mass frame, right, we have that P2 is minus P3. <clears throat> Sorry, minus P1. 
please correct me if I make stupid mistakes. All right. So that square root of p1 dot p2 squared minus m1 m2 squared is just e1 plus e2 times the magnitude of p1. Simple um, direct substitution would give it. I just did it, uh, just do it. You know. In that case, we have for the cross section, sigma, again, very similar to what we had previously, sigma is S over 64 pi squared P1 plus C2 P1, and then integral of M squared two pi to the four delta four P1 plus P2 minus P3 minus P4 divided by, as we had here, so square root of P3 squared plus M squared, then square root of P3, P4 squared plus N4 squared, and then integral D cubed P3, D cubed P4. So I, I simply substitute in here. Right, hopefully I did not make any confusion with the two pies, but it's just a substitution. And then we're really repeating the same, exactly the same thing as we did previously, right? So we just write down the delta function, delta to the four. So delta to the four of P1 plus P2 minus P3 minus P4 is just delta of E1 plus E2 minus one P3 zero minus P4 zero and times delta cube since uh, P1 plus P2 are zero. So I'm gonna just end up with P3 plus P4. Right. P1 plus P2 or equal to zero in the center of mass frame. Right. So we can use that to carry the P4 integral, right? So P, P4 becomes minus P3, which is obvious. The outgoing particles in the certain of mass, center of mass frame have a different, the opposite um, momenta. And so we end up, just carrying that, we end up with sigma is just s over eight pi squared. Again, check me with the, not going now carefully over all the pi's, so just check it out that I didn't make anything stupid here. E1 plus E2, P1, and then integral of M squared times delta E1 plus E2 minus square root of P3 squared plus M3 squared minus square root of P3 squared plus M4 squared times one over P3 squared plus M3 squared square root of P4, or P3 squared plus M4 squared, D cubed P3. Now, uh, M can also depend on the um, not just the magnitude, but the orientation or the direction of P3. So we cannot simply carry the angular integration. Let me write it down since M may depend 
on the direction of P3. You cannot simply carry the angular integration. But the good thing is that we often don't care about the angular integration because that gives us the full cross section. What we care about is the cross section per unit solid angle, right? But what we really want, we mostly want is the sigma over the omega. So we don't really have to carry the, the angular in integration, but simply write so writing dp3 is just p squared dp d omega. Then simply avoid the angular integration by writing down d sigma over d omega, just s over eight pi squared e1 plus e2 p1. Then integral zero to infinity of m squared delta, and we have the same delta here, of the same delta that we have. Ah, it's right now. Because integral of m squared delta e1 plus e2 minus square root of p squared plus m3 squared minus square root of p squared plus m4 squared divided by square root of p squared plus m3 squared and then square root of p squared plus m4 squared times p squared dp. But well, this is exactly the same integral that we had previously, right? Simply exchange m1 with e1 plus e2 and uh, m2 with m4, and that's what we got. So we already solved this integral. So we get that the sigma over the omega is just one over eight pi squared times s times m squared divided by e1 plus e2 squared times pf over pi. So PF and PI are the magnitudes of, it doesn't matter which one because they're the same, right? The magnitude of the one of the outgoing particle and the magnitude of the one of the incoming particles. PF magnitude of um, either outgoing particles, momenta, and the same PI and the, the incoming. All right, so in fact, once you do the calculation once, it's the same calculation for both the scattering and the decay. I would say that the main difference is in the scattering, you work in the center of mass frame and in the decay, well, it's the difference, right? You work in the rest frame of the particle, which is the center of mass frame. Okay, I think this is a good time to stop because I think I already ran out of time a little bit. Any questions?
Any questions by everybody? By anybody? No? Well, then no. Then in that case, I think we can stop here. We'll stop the recording. <laughs>